2022 or Death Holler brought us Season 3 Slash or Pass It became the classic horror film podcast of its time Now Death Holler brings us the most shocking season ever Season 4 Dead or dead Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Imagine, if you will, that one of the hosts is absolutely terrified of zombies. So, what's the plan? Bash him in the head. That seems to work out. Now, accept the fact there is no escaping this horror. Death Holler brings back the dead. Remember... When you're in Death Holler, listener discretion is advised. With hospitality like this, you'll never want to leave. We hope you stay alive. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. So neither one of them saw through that part of it. Ben did say that, and he had a point that if they ever broke into the basement, they're fucked in the yes. basement. There's no way out. That's legit. I understand that. But if the two of them would work together and been willing to, and that's the whole other thing about this movie about working together, if they would have worked together and Harry had helped them secure the upstairs and they would have kept the downstairs as a backup, they would have all been saved. Yes. And the two couldn't work together because they were both up their own asses. And and Harry, of course, is the worst of the two because he's a, you know, I mean, he's cowardly. Yes. He's very, he's ultra conservative, like it's the basement or nothing. He's like all about turtling up. And, and I mean, and I think Ben is too reckless in the movie, but I think that Harry's too, like, you know, we, we've got to, we've just got to hole up. And it's like, that's not going to save you either. You got to have a mix of the two. Yeah, I mean, I understand Harry just kind of wanting to focus just on his family. And let's be honest, nobody owns that house. No. They all Uh, just, so they can't stake claim on anything. Like, I guess if Harry wanted to stake claim on the basement because that's where he feels it's safe, pop off, you know. But you can't, he really can't tell Ben what to do. Ben really can't tell him what to do. I understand the point of working together, Um and but if they had worked together, they yeah. would have probably noticed that the keys for the gas pumps would have been downstairs in the basement. That is true. <laughs> oh, that's a sad part of the movie. Well, it's not, it's sad, but it's oh god, I don't know. I mean the the only person in the movie who ends up being ha- halfway reasonable is Tom and Judy, but they're but I mean they're too naive to to I mean and and there's not enough uh, of their own like. They're followers. They're not leaders. So if the two leaders are not working, then that they're is not true. working. Yeah. I mean, and if I were in this situation, the leader, in my opinion, would be Ben. Uh, uh, Harry just seemed too cowardly, and he seemed to, it's about me and my family only, and fuck you guys. I don't want to be with somebody that's, like, only thinking about their own. Sometimes in things like this, you have to work well in, as a group. Now, to give Harry a one out of credit, mm-hmm. he did suggest that they put Barbara in the basement because she was already catatonic and not helping anybody, and Ben refused to send her down there. And I don't understand the point of that at all. She wasn't helping. She was just sitting there as a hindrance. Yeah. If she would have been down there in the basement, then that would have at least kept her. I mean, that wouldn't have saved her from, you know, Karen. Yes. But that's. 
we'll get to that as far as the irony of the Karen situation. But uh, nobody knew that if you got bit, you was going to turn into one of them. In this yeah, movie. not at that point. Well, didn't they finally say it on the news thing, though? Uh, I don't think they ever officially did. And if they did, it was right before she turned. So okay. it wasn't even like it was enough inform- enough time for them to use it, you know? Yeah. Um. Shit. I really thought that the news person said something. No, he didn't. He just said that they're coming back to life. Yeah, I mean, they had more than that. I mean, there was they had more clips, but I don't think they ever discussed the fact that if you get bit, you'll turn into one of them. Okay, yeah. So, but I'm but Harry did suggest that they put Barbara down in the basement to kind of get her out of the immediate area, and then Ben just being a his and being too stubborn was like, "Fuck you! I hate you! I'm not going to listen to anything you say," and. I think if he would have made some kind of peace offering to Harry and at least acknowledge that, yes, I understand your family, you know, is, is in trouble. But if you work with me, then maybe we can protect them even more. If he would have done something that might've helped out. I just think the two of them together were just, I mean, they weren't willing to compromise was the problem yeah. at all. Everyone working together would have been a lot better than what they had. Um, Barbara, on the other hand, she wasn't in the way, though. She was just there, and it was like, why are you here? Yeah, she was just kind of laying there, but I mean, like, she was also distracting him at times because she'd start popping off shit about Johnny was, you know, with the, he had the keys, and then, you know, that got Ben all riled up. He's like, you got a car? And it's like, no, don't worry about it. She wrecked it. It's too far away. You're not going to get to it. Don't fucking worry about that thing, you know? Yeah. But he got him all distracted because he heard her mention a car, you know? Yeah. So all she did was just distract. She didn't really help with anything else until she did help that final scene <laughs> where, you know, Ben was like, you know, caught at the, the, one of the windows and she went to help him. And then of course, Johnny showed up and then she was gone again. Oh so. my God. Literally. <laughs> um, but I was just thinking, I think it's interesting that it's like there's stereotypes for, or archetypes for what, you know, how people react in like chaotic situations. Yeah, um, that's true. Every every zombie film, honestly, but this was this was the starting. This was the beginning. Well, you get heroes in the following films that actually are able to work together and actually have a, more sense to them, uh, especially starting in Dawn. I mean, they they that group uh, they they had some issues at first, but they got through them. Yeah, and, and the only thing that really broke them apart was the fact that they got attacked by a bunch of humans, and they were too stubborn to give up what they had and just get the fuck out of there. They were a little too greedy. That was their issue. I mean, I can't. Well, let's not get into that because other than I can't blame them. I'd want to fight for what I was. I was there first, you know. Well, and they secured the place. They went through a lot of trouble, and they lost. I mean, we're getting in the movie. I mean, before it gets there. <laughs> But they lost one of their own to set up the place, so I get it. But just like the female of the group told them, she's like, we have no reason. I mean, just let them have it. They're going to, we're just going to, we're risking our lives trying to protect this place, you know? Yeah. Um. So, uh, but this movie, they just, uh, nobody got along. And, no. uh, and and again, I think that's a central message that, that he really was trying to impart, like, it was society wise. He didn't see anybody trying to work together. And that's what he was trying to put in this movie. Uh, acting the, I mean, I think that Harry and Ben are pretty good. Yes. I mean, I'm not saying that the others are bad, but I mean, you can clearly tell that Tom and Judy are the least of the bunch. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Same in then, the next uh, movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, music, we've already discussed, but I, I think it's crazy that uh, Romero used that, you know, like stock music in such a way to make the movie the way he did. I mean, it. it it's, I just it's know little, that was a lot of work. Yeah, it's it's overly dramatic at parts, but at times, but when it hits, it hits. It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to say about the movie before we get into trivia? No, we'll save it for the end. Okay. This is one of the most profitable independent movies ever made, made for 114000 which is equivalent to 941800 in 2022. Uh, it grossed approximately $30 million, which is the equivalent to $247.8 million uh-huh. in 2022. And it uh, means it was over 263 times its budget. Oh. 
Uh, George A. Romero saw very little of the profit from the film, however, because uh, due to his lack of knowledge regarding distribution deals, the distributors walked away with practically <gasps> all of it. That's fucked up. And the distributors are the ones that caused the copyright issue, but I'll get that in a minute. Dick wads. Uh, the U.S. movie rating system was instituted on November 1st, 1968. This film released on October 1st, 1968, and so it remains one of the last films released in the U.S. without an actual rating. Hell yeah. When the writers decided to base the film on zombies, they brainstormed about what would be the most shocking thing for the zombies to do to people, and they decided cannibalism. Yep. It works. Uh, when the zombies were eating the bodies in the burnout truck, they were actually eating roast ham ah. covered in chocolate sauce. Ew. The filmmakers joked that it was so nausea-inducing that it was almost a waste of time putting the makeup on the zombies as they end up looking pale and sick anyway. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, roast ham with chocolate. Yeah. Uh, the character of Ben was originally supposed to be a crude but resourceful truck di- driver with no specification to race. After Dwayne Jones in real life, a serious, uh, self-serious uh, erudite academic audition for the part, uh, director and co- uh, co-writer George A. Romero rewrote the part to fit his performance. Nice. Um, he actually, uh, the, I mean, they completely changed the character because, I mean, apparently this was uh, the way that he is in this movie to a certain extent outside of being, you know, like slapping people and all that, uh, it, you know, kind of to himself and, you know, and all that was how Dwayne really was in real life. They said in between scenes, he would stay away from the rest of the group and basically just read a book or something. He was like very introverted, you know, highly intelligent person. Yeah. Um, uh, the body upstairs uh, in the house was made by director George A. Romero using ping pong balls for the eyes. That's hella funny. <laughs> Uh, George A. Romero chose Evans City Cemetery for the first scene due to largely uh, largely to its isolated location. The crew didn't want to be interrupted by onlookers or police inquiring about their presence. The cemetery on top of a hill in a heavily wooded area allowed them privacy. Ironically, it has became a very popular tourist attraction and fan destination in the decades since its release. What? That's wild. Yeah, people go there all the time just so that they say they can visit it. You know, they visit the <laughs> Nine Living Dead Cemetery. Oh, my God. Uh, Russell Striner's mother, Russell Striner was the one who played Johnny, by the way. Yeah. Uh, owned, uh, Steiner's mother owned Barbara and Johnny's car. The cemetery scenes were shot over two days. Someone ran into the car during a break in filming, leaving a den in it that was easily visible on camera. So George A. Romero rewrote the scene so that they came to a stop after crashing into a tree. Oh, my God. So the, the the only reason she crashed into a tree was because the car already had the dent in it and they had to explain it somehow. Nice. The word zombie is never used in this film. The most nope. common euphemism used to describe the living dead is those things, mostly by Cooper. Other characters refer to the creatures as ghouls and flesh eaters, which was the original title of the movie. Uh, however, the film codified many tropes about zombies that have been used in many movies since, including zombies eating human flesh and that zombies can only be killed by shooting them in the head. Uh, and they don't eat brains in this movie, folks. That's Return of the Living Dead. Oh, get it, yeah. Get it straight. And not only that, but, I mean, I feel like there's so many zombie movies out here where they don't use the word zombie, and when somebody says the word zombies, other people get offended that they said, no, they're not zombies. Those don't exist. They do that in Shaun of the Dead. They, he says, don't use the Z word. Uh, they say that in uh, Cadaver Christmas because the main character keeps saying they're cadavers and everybody's like, there's not, he's like, no, they're cadavers. Did they, did they use it in stalled? I feel like stalled. It was, no, they're not zombies. I don't think they ever mentioned what they were in that okay. movie, to be honest with you. Um, now regarded as a classic, the film attracted considerable criticism at the time of its release due to its graphic use of gore, and it, and it was drastically different yes. at the time. Uh, actor, co-producer Cole Hardman, Harry Cooper, the father in the basement, also served as makeup artist, electronic nice. sound effects engineer, and he took the still shots used for closing the closing <sighs> credits. I love the closing credits on both this and the remake. Yeah, they actually... The remake was the ri- was some of the ones they couldn't use in this movie. Oh, nice. I love that. Yeah, because there was stills that they had that made the group look more like a lynch mob. Okay. And because of the race relationships going on at the time, the distributor was like, cut that shit out of the movie. We don't want to get in trouble. I'm, and so I'm going to say it now. At the end of the remake, they all look like the KKK. 
<laughs> not do, a, yeah. I mean, they don't have the hoods, don't get me wrong, but they look like a bunch of white folk on the hunt for the color folk, if you catch my drift. They look, <sighs> they, they're as backwoods looking, and it just, I was looking at it, the way that they talk and everything, and the way that they're acting, it's it's way more, like, I don't know. It's just so much more upfront in that film than it is what people thought they saw. Just say they look like they could be my neighbors and be done with it. That's what you're trying to say. I I didn't want to say it. Okay. But you said it, (laughs) not me. Um, After Dwayne Jones set the chair on fire, Gary Striner, uh, Russell Striner's brother, was supposed to extinguish the flames and set the chair on fire again to preserve continuity, ensuring that the smoke would be emanating from it near the end of the film. At one point, Gary's sleeve caught fire (gasps) as he ran in terror uh, mm. Bill Heinzman in full zombie makeup tackled him to the ground and helped extinguish <laughs> the flames, saving him from major injury. Good for him, but that's a hell of funny. Uh, one of the working titles was not of Anubis, the no. god of mummification in ancient Egyptian religion. The title was changed once George Romero learned that very few people understood that reference. Yeah, I, that would not have worked out. And I just saw a meme the other day, which is so funny because they're like, you know, zombies. Uh, eat people, vampires suck blood. What do mummies do? And somebody's like, mummies just beat the shit out of you. Uh, nerd alert, but in D&D, they give you a, a raging virus or contagion whenever they hit you with their hands. A so, contagion, uh, that, that makes sense because th- there's certain films that make it sound like mummies have like a bacteria on them or something. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that's what they do. They don't they don't exactly take anything from you, but they will give you something yes. that you don't want. They're givers, not takers. <laughs> uh, Bosco chocolate syrup was used to s- simulate the blood in the movie. Hell so. yeah. In his final interview for his death, Dwayne Jones admitted that he had never seen any of the other dead movies, nor any other George A. Romero movie. Okay. That's the way he said it, though, he wasn't implying that he felt any certain way about George. It's just like he yeah, had no he just interest hadn't seen in that type of That's movie. That's just so weird, though. I, I don't know. Okay. He did own a copy of Not a Living Dead, though, because at some point, because years later, uh, this was in that same interview, he said that one of his friends at the college uh, was wanting to do a fundraiser, and they knew that he was in Night of the Living Dead, and they wanted to use that movie as like a screening or something. And he uh, didn't have a copy, so he called up George and uh, and Russo, and he said he went to him, and he was just going to pay to rent it or whatever. And they said, "No, that's your copy. Using the movie, dude. Keep it." You know, so he he did get a copy later on in life of the movie, even though he never watched, you know, really watched it after that. Yeah. Uh, George Romero originally hired Tom Savini to do the makeup effects for this film. The two were introduced when Savini auditioned for an acting role in an earlier film that never got off the ground. Romero, remembering that Savini was also a makeup artist, he bought his makeup portfolio, he brought it to the audition, called Savini to set on uh, his horror movie. However, Savini was unable to do the effects because he was in the U.S. Army serving as a combat photographer in Vietnam whenever this movie was being filmed. Combat photography? Yes. I mean, I understand the importance of that. Don't get me wrong, but really? <laughs> yeah, he, well, Savini mentions it. I mean, uh, that the shit that he saw in Vietnam, he said he was numb. He said he felt like a zombie for years Jesus. after fucking coming back. Holy shit. He, and he said that that's maybe why he got famous for the makeup effects he did, because he said if it didn't look like what his photography looked like from the field, Jesus. he wouldn't do it. Okay respect but damn uh columbia pictures was the only major hollywood studio interested in distributing this film but eventually passed because it was in black and white and at the time the movies had to compete with new color televisions uh columbia did distribute the 1990 version uh okay however american international pictures considered recently the film releasing the film but wanted george Ray romero to shoot an upbeat ending and add more of a love story Ew. subplot, and he said, fuck you, and yeah. didn't go that route. You can fuck right the fuck off with that. Hold on, I got a question. Savini later directed Night of the Living Dead in 1990. Do yeah. We, do we have um, trivia on what George thought about that? I don't know that's in there, but, I mean, I can tell you when we get to it. Okay. I mean, he that's actually, fine. I mean, the short suite of it, he's, he went to Savini and said, I don't trust anybody else to do this movie okay. but you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's that's what I that's that makes my heart happy. Uh let's see. When applying makeup for the actors playing zombies, Marilyn Eastman focused less on rotting appearance for most of them, instead of concentrating on their most prominent facial feature. 
uh, and having it appear more prominent for unsettling image. Uh, Eastman also played the zombie who eats a bug off a tree. Yeah. Uh, George o. Romero points out that no one can tell it's her underneath all the makeup on her face, and she did her own makeup for that shot, which Hell is pretty yeah. cool. That's how most of us uh, look nowadays, folks. <laughs> The film's first scene, the initial cemetery, uh, cemetery attack on Barbara and Johnny, was actually the last scene to be filmed in November 1967. The, car- the actress had to hold their breath to avoid visible condensation in the frosty autumn air. Damn. Uh, George A. Romero has readily admitted that Herc Harvey's Carnival of Souls was a big influence in the making of this film. That is such a good film. And it's like a short film or no? It's it's a shorter movie, yeah, but it's, it's a, a full length feature. Jesus um, Christ, I haven't seen that in so long. But that is from what really I remember. Good. Yeah, from what I remember, it is just um, dark. Well, it's it's kind of like a weird twist and nightmare when it gets later on in the movie because she goes to like this abandoned carnival mm-hmm. that's like you know, and then starts seeing all this weird shit. It's it's trippy as fuck. Uh, there are two known deleted scenes that were removed at the ins- insistence of distributor Walter Reed organization. They include an eight minute expository scene in the basement between Helen and Harry at the bottom of the stairs, which explains the abrupt jump cut that's shown. Yeah. And Romero hates that jump cut like, or hated it. He said that it was one of the worst things that he, he said when he saw it, it just made him cringe. Jesus. Um, as well as a wide shot of numerous zombies covering the landscape, which was replaced with footage of the zombies eating near the end of the film. The footage was presumed lost when a flood damaged the storage facility years later at Image 10 Incorporated. Um, that scene of the numerous zombies covering the landscape would have been probably fucking cool because that would have gave you a yeah. better idea of how massive you know it really was at that point in time. Uh, Bill Cardell, who played the television reporter, was indeed a local Pittsburgh TV celebrity. He hosted a horror movie program on Channel 11 and occasionally reported the news. Uh, when one of the one of his the first films to graphically depict violent murders on screen, it is also one of the first films to have a black person as the main character. Oh shit! Uh, one of the Walter Reed organization's publicity stunts was a fifty thousand dollar insurance policy against anyone dying from a heart attack. While watching this film. Hold on one second. One of Walter Reed's organization's public. Oh shit. Publicity stunts. Okay. Yeah. So they basically was like, uh, if you die of a heart attack from this, you're going, your family get paid $50,000, you know, can you imagine if they had like offered that today (laughs) as a joke, that would not fucking fly. Uh, given the circumstances around a certain other thing, uh, increasing the likelihood of heart attacks (laughs) that probably wouldn't be offered anyway. Yeah. Uh, George A. Romero's final title for the film was Night of the Flesh Eaters. Okay. When the film was delivered to Walter Reed, this is how they lost their copyright. Their people discovered that there was an earlier film, The Flesh Eaters, from 1964. The people at Walter Reed decided to change the title to Night of the Living Dead. What they failed to realize was that the copyright notice uh, that appeared on the screen under the original title was not like superimposed. It happened to be directly attached to the Night of the Flesh Eaters. And so when they took that off, they took off the copyright. Oh, fuck. Because they, if they were superimposed a little C at the end of it, then whatever they were put in front of it would have been fine. But since it wasn't superimposed and it was attached, it took it all off. Shit. Um, as a result, release prints of Die Living Dead were made without a copyright notice, and at that time, this meant that the film, by default, fell automatically and Shit. completely into public domain. Uh, the filmmakers lost untold millions of dollars uh, when unauthorized 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter prints were made, especially in the home video era when video copies were widely available to the public without any fees being paid. That is so sad. Romero would have been one of the richest men around oh, yeah. if, if, from this one movie if that hadn't happened. Uh, w- Bill Heinzman play, uh, based his character Saunter and subsequently that of each z- other zombie on a film from Boris Karloff, the title of which he could not remember, but most likely was The uh, Walking Dead from 1936. Hilarious that The Walking Dead... Yeah inspired this that inspired the walking dead that's all other thing uh in that film Karloff played a man risen from the dead and walks with a characteristic ungainly saunter uh which Karloff was probably just mimicking what he did in the mummy anyways because he did the same thing in that movie so uh you could probably say that zombies weird walk is due to the mummy if nothing else i feel like if you 
if you're making a film and you're hiring a bunch of friends or you're just like, okay, we got to make this for cheap and we want them to have that zombie look, get a bunch of people, late 30s, early 40s, maybe even a little older, have them lay in a cold room for... <laughs> I don't know, an hour just in one position. You can't you can't change position. No body pillows, nothing. And then get up and start walking. Even better, same scenario, but have them lay on a beanbag. Oh. No. When they get up and their back refuses to uh, unfold itself, they will saunter just like a zombie for, for a long time. Or I don't know if you can agree with me on this one. Um, it might just be because I'm short, though. An office chair. Like, even with my feet touching the ground, I think I'm too short for the length of the office chair, so I can't sit all the way in the chair. I have to sit forward a little bit, and when I get up, it's like I've been straddling a horse or something, but my hips, I am I got this waddle, man. <laughs> it's like I, I don't tend to have that problem at office chairs, but my feet are very much playing on the ground with those things. Well, so I don't... la de freaking <laughs> da, okay? Good for you. <laughs> Uh, Felicidades, okay, because you're taller. <laughs> that reminds me of some movie. I, I think it by Nick, Nick Cage that said it, but it was like, good for you. No, it was uh, no, it was not that. It was uh, uh, Christian Bale. He's like, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, Barbara says they ought to make the day, the time changes the first day of summer. Uh, the spring forward day for daylight savings time in 1968 was April 28th, making that the day that the movie's uh, zombie apocalypse officially takes place. Oh, cool. Uh, George A. Romero always got asked if the tombstone Barbara is kneeling in front of was fake or not, and he would always respond, are you kidding? Uh, uh, we couldn't afford fake <gasps> tombstones in those days. Yeah, that is true. Uh, one of the original script ideas called for Barbara to be very strong, charismatic character. Instead, George A. Romero and the producers loved Judith O'Day's portrayal as a terrified young girl much better and edited the script to accommodate the part. The idea of Barbara being a strong central character was revisited in Not Living Dead. Also, Romero would go on to say that he would go back. This is the one thing that he regretted most about this movie. He said he would go back and he would see people making comments about it being a civil rights thing and all that and poo-poo it. But he said anybody who made the comment that he was misogynistic slightly and how he made her just like this fainting lily or whatever, he said he actually felt bad, and he said that he agreed with him, and he said his tri he tried to apologize for that by making every woman in the movie since then stronger individuals, basically. Okay. Look at That is learning from your mistakes. He, he listened. He realized, yeah, I definitely see some, some validity in this, and then he grew from it yeah and i mean it's it it's you know i mean a good person that'll sit there and admit their faults and i mean like i said he he would uh, freely admit like you know he wouldn't take credit for stuff he didn't put in there and he would freely admit it's like no i fucked that up you know so yeah. that's good on him uh, the gas pump judith o'day runs into at the beginning of the film was not bolted to the ground and when she hit it uh, she hit it with so much force that she almost tipped it over into the cameraman in that scene. And that's the dent that's to show why there was a dent in the car? No. Oh, that, okay. The gas pump that she grabs onto for a split second oh, whenever yes. she's running from the zombie, okay. it wasn't held to anything. Oh, So she okay. almost, like, tipped over with it. Yeah, that's hella funny. Okay. Uh, 200 extras were cast in the parts of townspeople and zombies. Damn. Um, and uh, they have, like, a bunch of them that's on the, the Criterion disc talking about how the process of going and being made into zombies, and they all fucking loved it. Like, every single one of them were, like, having a blast. Uh, the film was released shortly before the MPAA's rating system was implemented. As a result, children were actually able to see this very graphic horror film in the theaters. Hell, yeah. A review, a review by critic Roger Ebert. Boo. Boo. Uh, included included his concerned observations of the children watching with him and being traumatized by an adult for a story that they were completely unprepared for. Oh, shut up, Roger. You don't even know about the children <laughs> at home that have been traumatized by this film. Raise your hand if you're a victim of that, because uh, here's my hand up in the air. <laughs> 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 Jesus, it doesn't matter. Like if the parents take them, that that's that's on the parent. It really is. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, that's like whenever I told you off air, whenever I watched, I, I did watch that one movie that I forgot about, Rabid Grannies, which I actually love, <laughs> which was like a, a European trauma style movie. Yeah. And uh, Lloyd Kaufman said that they would, uh, <laughs> my favorite thing that this man has ever said, uh, he said that the MPAA would make them cut a bunch of shit out to get an R rating. They would do that. Then they would release the uncut movie into the theater and just let things fall where they fell at because they knew the MPAA wouldn't go back and rewatch it. Yeah. And he said the only time it bit them in the ass was whenever they, of all movies, Blood Sucking Freaks, which I I watched that movie on the drive in uh, or Joe Bob's drive in show and it was disturbing to me the shit that's in that movie, uh, even to this day. And uh, he said some woman brought her five year old son into that movie and they complained right. that it was so graphic and he said that they ended up paying like a pretty huge fine for the MPAA for that oh movie God. because of it. People uh, are, and, and then he, but he pointed out, he's like, who brings the <clears> five-year-old <throat> to a movie called blood sucking? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I feel like she, no, she's just, she's just dumb. Here's the thing. And what is the MPAA even really useful for? Maybe I guess for people to look up because we have so much at our hands now at our disposal to be like, should I take my five-year-old to this film? And at that point, if you take your five-year-old to that film, that's on you. I know back then we didn't have that. And so we'll excuse it for that. But for nowadays, it's not worth anything because you got these films now, no children under 17. You can still get a child under 17 if they're with an adult. Yeah, um, I feel like that the MPAA, uh, going by what Lloyd Kaufman says to a certain degree, is just a way to fuck over the independent mo- filmmakers anyways because uh, big movie companies behind the table pay a lot to get shit yes. movies that probably shouldn't be there. Yes. Because he would mention that stuff they would have to cut out, he said he would see in AAA movies uh, that and, when, and actually would have ratings that were PG-13, and they were saying he couldn't even do that and get an R rating for I feel like you almost like should make a film and you're like, please, if you're under the age of 15, don't don't bring your children under the age of 15 to this. And I'd be like, fuck, yeah, I'm bringing my kids like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've heard it's even worse now, though, because the MPAA isn't national. It's like international. Ugh. And so like they're applying even uh, worse like guidelines than they used to whenever they were just nationally based. It's crazy because some countries are way more like liberal, especially when it comes to like sex scenes and things like that. But then some are just so fucking up tight. Uh, Britain still won't play like a good percentage of the movies that we like the, that we covered even last season in a uh, uh, slasher season. They won't even allow them to, to air over there because of the rules against violence. The UK is becoming so much more boring than like their bean toast that they rant and rave about. Like I hate to bring this up, but we're going to have a season called when bad animals go bad, but they don't even allow pit bulls anymore. I guess they have to be caged up or they have to be fucking muzzled and everything. If they're to go out, Outside and they really can't go outside. They if they're only allowed to go out to like go to the vet or be transported somewhere. And I'm like, why are you treating these dogs like guns? Oh, you mean to tell me like you're so afraid? Your weapon? They weaponize everything. <laughs> uh, you can be arrested for calling somebody a lesbian over there. So oh! um, <laughs> I mean, that's. And that's what some people would like our country to be like. And I and I feel bad for any of our listeners who are in that area. Yeah. I, I feel like. You're, you should have the right to say whatever you want to say, and, you know, and they should fuck off, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's becoming wild out there. Uh, while writing the script, uh, uh, the George A. Romero and John A. Russo were trying to think of a manner in which to destroy the zombies. Marilyn Eastman joked they should throw pr- pies in the faces of the zombies, and that actually stuck, <laughs> and they used it in the sequel for Dawn of the Dead. Hell yeah. Uh, the music used in this film was, like I said, public domain from Capital EMI Records, High Q Stock Music Library. It was originally used in Teenagers from Outer Space and cost the filmmakers only $1,500 to use. Woo. Uh, George A. Romero was one of the was the one operating the camera when Bill Heinzman attacks Barbara in her car, smashing the window with a rock. When Heinzman shattered the window, uh, window, he barely missed Romero with a rock. Damn. It is never explained why the dead body found upstairs in the house never comes back to life, as we said. That is so sad. That uh, Like, justice for the I, body I, upstairs. I, I can tell you why it didn't. Because that face, they could not make 
yes. work on a person with the, 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 but I mean, th- it was something they didn't think about, honestly. Is yeah. The reason, well, but. and I'm not upset about it. I mean, like, we don't know. Cause like, as far as you can tell, you can only see the face. Can you see the whole body? I couldn't see the whole body. They show the whole body later on because oh. he, he wraps it up and actually, uh, it gains a face back because I think this in the trivia, the body that gets drug out is actually a uh, little Karen uh, playing another part at that point. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't realize that. I, I guess I must've missed that, but I didn't think it even had a body attached. I just saw a face. I'm like, oh, for all we know. Um, yeah. They, they drag it outside, but it's like, you know, it, it's, I mean, it, it's got a face when they drag it out. Cause yeah. it's just Karen, you know, as the body laying yeah. there. Um, I mean, I'm just saying though, like that, that it was good for a good jump scare. So it was definitely necessary. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's one of the best visual effects in the movie. Yeah. Um, as George Romero explains in the directors, the films of George A. A Romero, the the day the final editing and voiceover dubbing was complete on uh, April 4th, 1968, he and John A. Russo literally threw the film in the trunk of their car and drove to New York to see if anyone wanted to show it. While driving through New York on the night of April 4th, 1968, uh, Romero and Russo (sighs) heard the news on the radio that Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated, and that's whenever he had that terrible thought, our movie's probably going to do pretty good. Yeah. Uh, after being shot by Ben Cooper stumbles down in the basement in order to die next to Karen, his daughter, as he had shown no redeeming qualities throughout the film. His final moment was Romero's way of showing that Cooper had at least some form of humanity and decency in him seeking to spend his last dying moment with his daughter. Oh, and then he uh, gets much eaten by the, her and then he gets his hand eaten off by yeah. her. Yes. Uh, much of the dialogue was improvised. Uh, which is actually surprising because yeah. I feel like it's pretty natural in the movie. Maybe Barbara was like so quiet and not worth anything because she couldn't come up, come up with any fucking lines. Did any of you think about that? No, because you only think about yourselves. <laughs> uh, well, she did have those lines just rambling about Johnny. So, I mean, there's that. Yeah, and then they were like, the fuck this woman talking about? Slap her and make her fall asleep again. <laughs> and they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, John A. Russo points out how Night of the Living Dead was the first movie to feature flesh-eating zombies, and they had to invent how ghouls, as they called them, walked and moved. He points out that Bill Heinzman, who played the first zombie uh, Barbara comes across, had difficulty figuring out how to move. The script called them slow-moving, but he had to be strong enough to break windows and bust down doors. George A. Romero's direction to him on the day that he had to, the last day that he had to do that, when he was way too animated, George just said, do it anyway. Yeah. And he did. Um, when Ben is nailing wooden boards to the door, small numbers can be seen on them. These were written on the backs of the boards so they could be removed and replaced in between shots, ah! preserving continuity. Some numbers were visible because the boards got turned around and That's pointed the wrong funny. way. Uh, while filming the final zombie attack scene, George Romero did not inform Dwayne Jones that Kyra Sean, playing Karen, would sneak up and grab him from Ooh. behind. That resulted in him authentically being shocked in that scene and and whenever he shrugged her away. Hell yeah. Uh, uh, Similarly, Romero did this to Ken Forhey, uh, who played Peter during the filming of Dawn of the Dead when the child zombies attacked Peter at the uh, airport office. He didn't know that they were going to pop in on him in that Uh, movie either. No, like, don't. I'll fucking die on your set. Do you want the set to be haunted? Because I will... I will die, and I will come they would, back. They, they would have had paid somebody that fifty thousand dollars on yes. the set for. I mean, whenever they that kid popped out and was trying to bite my arm or no, whatever. No, I'm not surviving. I'm not fucking surviving. <laughs> uh, this is obviously George Romero's feature debut. Uh, one of the working titles for this film was Night of the Flesh Eaters. Originally, the beings attacking the creatures were extraterrestrial in origin, either aliens or humans possessed by an alien pathogen presumably covering an, uh, a NASA satellite returning from Venus. Eventually, it was decided the dead would rise and devour the living, presumably due to the radiation that was carried by the satellite. Uh, in the film, the dead were referred to as flesh eaters a few times. Um, and the working title was not of the Nubis, but uh, yeah. they, you know, they, like I said, they didn't use that for obvious reasons. Uh, Judith Ridley worked as receptionist uh, for Carl uh, Art Hardman and um, Marilyn Eastman, which led to her getting the part in the movie. Uh, Johnny, 
Sheriff McClellan and Karen probably have less than 10 minutes of screen time combined, but they're responsible for the film's two most quoted lines. They're coming to get you, Barbara. And yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. And the most unforgettable moment when Karen stabs her mother to death with a trowel. Yes. Uh, Zombie wise, the graveyard ghoul at the beginning played by Bill Heinzman is very fondly remembered, mostly for being the first on-screen flesh-eating zombie, as well as being incredibly terrifying in the process. Oh, 100%. <clears throat> He's probably the scariest zombie in the movie, honestly. So, uh, Judith Ridley read for Barbara originally, but she felt out of her depth in the role. I did see that interview where she said that. She basically, uh, when she started reading the part and realized how much Barbara had to do, she was like, um, I don't think I could do this. So, kudos to her for recognizing her, you know, in a, you know, her, limitations okay and wait. they were like oh that's How much fine Barbara you had play to do? judy what 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 did barbara do well I'm she did have to, she did have to be like out there like emotion wise and okay. and judith didn't know that she could bring that okay basically. i can respect that uh when the zombies uh, saw the house at the end of the film barbara snaps out of her derangement survival instinct kicks in and she reacts to the zombies with anger and rage fighting with everything she's got to keep them away this is a leftover concept from one of Romero's early drafts, which would have featured her as a far more empowered and strong character, and they let her use that in the remake. So, nice. Carl Hardman is the real-life father of Kyra Sean. Uh, Hardman and Marilyn Eastman were business and romantic partners for over 40 years. Ooh. George Romero originally wanted to cast Betty Aberlin of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood as Barbara. Fred Rogers <laughs> told him no. I don't blame him. Uh, Mr. Rogers wanted to protect the image of his show, but he was a fan of both this film and Dawn of the Dead, with Rogers calling the later a lot of fun. Uh, Fred Rogers gave Romero one of his first jobs on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood by directing a segment about Rogers undergoing a tonsillectomy. So, and uh, somebody eating just, it. I'm just kidding. There's just something that warms my heart about Mr. Rogers uh, loving this movie and Dawn of the Dead. Why was he just a superhuman? He was just, he was a <laughs> national treasure because he was in the military. He was so soothing and calming for a lot of children and even children, especially like undiagnosed children, if you know what I mean, back in the day. Yeah. Autism of, of and any other, you know. <sighs> that TikTok, I mean, I grew up watching this show whenever yeah. I was a kid because we couldn't get any good te television stations, so I watched PBS, like, all the time as a kid, and this was my go-to show, like, it really yeah. was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So that meme that's going around on TikTok of him saying, I'm proud of you, I hope you know that. I hope like, you know it, that, yeah. There's just something about that that just... I love it so much. So I'm proud of you. You know that, right? I hope you do. Um, did you ever, okay. Did you ever see the episode of Mr. Rogers where he buttons his sweater incorrectly? Uh, I don't know that I did. My I mean, uncle I and I did, remember, but it's but been forever ago. Dude. And then, and then on top of him being as awesome as he was, he fucking likes horror films too. Hell yeah. Um, he's actually the one person or the one thing that gets me the most about the Mandela effect, because like I said, I watch that show all the time. So I would watch the intro and I knew that song. And whenever they said that there was like one particular lyric that changed or whatever, and like, and it's misremembered from what I, it, it, that's the one that gets me the most as far as that Mandela stuff goes. Yeah. It just cause it's musical. And you know, whenever you hear a song, like songs tend to stick with you cause you keep listening to them over and over again. Dude, listen to this. Okay, I, I don't know if it'll tell me which episode, and I'll try to find it at some other point. During one early episode, Fred buttoned his sweater wrong, but he opted to use the footage anyway, citing he wanted to know children that people make mistakes. And and he was. He was so fucking smooth about it. He, un awesome. he buttoned, it, uh, buttoned it wrong, realized it, but you, you would have never noticed until my uncle made a huge joke about it. It was hilarious, but... Well, didn't he also wear, like, sneakers that look like Chuck Taylors, like, before they were even, like, a big thing or something? Like, I feel like those sneakers he wore were, like, you know, kind of, I mean, different for the day. You know, I never understood. This is so funny. We're talking about Mr. Rogers right now. <laughs> I never understood why he came in and changed his jacket and put on a sweater and then put on different shoes. I never understood that. I feel like that was the thing they did back in the day. Like, I guess you know, so. men would Dressing come in, down. they had like lounging clothes, yeah. you know? Um, because, you know, they wore like suits and stuff more often back then. So you came home, it's like, I'm going to get out of this like, you know, constricting suit and get into something a little bit more comfortable. Type yeah. Thing. Oh, my God. Uh, at some point after the film's production, a tornado hit the cemetery location using the opening scene, uprooting trees and pulling more than 200 bodies 
to the surface. Uh, George A. Romero asked if the bodies walked, to which John A. Russo, who was telling the story, said uh, they tried to. Um, that's crazy that 200 bodies were pulled to the surface of that cemetery after they filmed this movie. No! <laughs> um, the character of Ben was written without race in mind, and John A. Russo and George Romero note they didn't factor color into casting. Romero points out they didn't change the script or the character once Dwayne Jones was cast. However, Jones changed his character as he didn't want to play a tough guy. Ben was originally written as a typical truck driver, but the actor wanted to be more subdued personality. Everyone in the commentary agrees his choices for the character work. Uh, Dwayne was an intellectual, says Carl Hardman, and that feeling came out in the way that he played the character. Yeah. Uh, George Romero points out the instance where two characters are both facing left while yeah. conversing an issue with a 180 degree rule in filmmaking. He notes they had no way of keeping track of those things in those days and mistakes like that were bound to happen. I and agree. He, he, but yeah, he, but later on in life, he just couldn't go back and watch this movie. Like he said, he would go to events where they were showing it, but he refused to watch it. Aww, basically what it, happened. It, like, it's probably one of those things where like, I don't know. I feel like this is more of a woman thing, but the things that keep you up at night and it's just random shit that nobody really cares about, but you make it this whole big deal. Yeah. I Aww, mean, I feel bad it's also, him. it's also, I feel like stuff that creators do anyways. Yeah. Like they go back and they look at their first things and they're like, Ugh, I don't want to remember that anymore. But you had, if you hadn't done that original thing, you wouldn't have got better. So yeah. I mean, it, it's part of it. I won't get the opportunity to be a creator. I don't have the drive in me and I just, I don't see that happening, but if it did, or if I had the opportunity to be a a creator ever of anything of this magnitude, I would want to be able to say that was shit, but I am still so proud of that shit. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I feel like some of them do. Some of them have a pretty good, like, you know, balance to it. They're like, there's problems with that, but I did the best I could. And that, you know, I did my best. I did my best. And then Mr. Rogers would say, I'm proud of you. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you know, I am. (laughs) Uh, The lightning effects were pulled off shooting uh, close-ups with the lights they had on set turned all the way up, almost widening out the objects or actors they were close to. Then they cut away from medium or long shots to these close-ups and then back again with a thunder sound to complete it. Uh, close-ups were used because the lights they had weren't strong enough to fill any shots that were wider. That's hell of likewise, <laughs> likewise, the only reason they decided to add the lightning at, at all was because it began to rain, and they were afraid that the rain would get picked up on the camera, so they added the lightning to kind of cover it up. Okay. It kind of adds a creepy factor to the movie. Yeah, so. that's true. I just, the lights, they were they were a bit much. I'm just going to say it. Yeah. Uh, while writing the screenplay for Night of the Living Dead, George Romero took on a separate job, and John Russo was tasked with writing the back half. When he finished, Romero read it and felt it was missing something. He felt the last act of the film needed one more attack sequence before the final attack, and Russo agreed that it filled a hole in the earlier draft. When in doubt, throw in one more zombie wave attack. It's a basic rule of zombie law. Wow. Uh, in 2014, George Romero wrote a Marvel comic, Empire of the Dead, that follows another fate or that shows another fate for Barbara in that version of it. Johnny drags Barbara out the window and away to an abandoned barn, a hunting posse uh, spots the two and starts firing, risking her life. Uh, Johnny jumps in the way of the bullets to shield his sister, sacrificing himself. And then Barbara ends up surviving the whole ordeal. So in the comic, Johnny's <clears throat> zombie actually saves Barbara from okay. the whole thing. But why was he dragging her away? Uh, to get her away from the rest of the zombies. Oh, Okay. And then he jumped in front of the bullets from the, you know, yeah. guns holding madman. Um, it's an interesting take. I think the movie clearly shows that Johnny just bit into her and the rest of them ate the shit out of her, and that's it. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, based on Johnny's impression of their grandfather in the beginning, he and Barbara were possibly supposed to be Jewish because he kind of gets like a little Yiddish lilt to how <laughs> their grandfather talked. Um. When Dwayne Jones came on board, he requested a few changes to Ben's character, including revisions to the dialogue to tone down the crude, volatile way in which, in which Ben was supposed to originally speak. These changes were implemented along with the way, and when an alternate, happier ending for the character was once considered, Jones actively fought for the grim, heartbreaking ending the film concludes with. 
uh, he's, he was on record saying, I convinced George that the black community would rather see me dead than saved after all that had gone on in a corny and symbolically confusing way. The heroes never die in American movies. The jolt of that and the double jolt of the hero being black seemed like a double barrel whammy. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, it is. Uh, the zombie hand that Tom hacks up with a kitchen knife was made of clay and filled with chocolate syrup. Gross. Uh, originally, one idea for the script called for Harry Cooper to die from the gunshot wound received from Ben before his daughter became a zombie, which would have resulted in Helen coming down the stairs to find him eating their daughter nice. rather than the daughter eating him. It was decided that this would probably be far too disturbing and graphic. Oh, it okay. was changed back to the idea of the daughter becoming a zombie first. Okay, yeah. I, not- don't, <laughs> I don't know how that's better, <laughs> but fine. And the daughter kills the mom. Yeah. Uh, the matricide scene, speaking of, was accomplished by having Kyra Sean stab repeatedly into an off-screen pillow with a trowel while a member of the FX crew threw chocolate syrup used to fake blood yeah. onto the wall. These scenes were looped with scenes of Marilyn Eastman screaming. The trowel used in the scene was purchased online years later and is now in a private collection. Wow. Uh, when Ben moves the body upstairs into another room, its face is intact. This was, in fact, Kyra Sean, who doubled his upstairs body as it was felt that a mannequin would look unrealistic as they dragged it out. I mean, they could have done it in the dark. It was so dark in these scenes, um, which I loved. So fucking scary, though. Uh, I feel like they could have got away with the mannequin. I think they could have, too. Yeah. I think that was a bit much. Uh, the filmmakers were accused to be, <laughs> of being satanically inspired by Christian <laughs> fundamentalist groups for the portrayal of the undead feasting on flesh and of the Cooper's zombie child attacking your mother. <sighs> of course. It's the 60s, too. So, I mean, yeah, you still had I, a lot of pearl clutchers. Um, yeah. When I think of, like, the fact that a bunch of, like, well-meaning mothers, like, got Silent Night, Deadly Night, like, removed from theaters after one week of being <laughs> in them and screwed that movie over. I'm still pissed to this day that yeah. shit like that goes on. Um, just don't take your kids to the movie. Just keep them from going. If you don't like it, I mean, yeah. it, don't fucking govern everybody else. Like they're your kids. Keep them at home. Uh, Cooper keeps insisting that they should lock themselves in the basement, but Ben refuses because there are no exits there in case the zombies break through. Cooper later orders Helen to go back down the basement in the third act anyway, wanting to keep her safe. It's at this point that their zombie or their daughter becomes a zombie and kills her. The double irony is that if Helen had stayed upstairs, she would have probably survived, well, at least until the rest of the zombies broke in, and that Ben survives by locking himself in the basement, which he desperately tried to avoid the entire fucking movie. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. So Cooper damned himself and his wife and then by wanting to go down to the basement and then Ben uh, survived by going down there after he told them they were fucking idiots. Oh, my God. Uh, John A. Russo asked Carl Hardman how he takes it that audiences cheer when Ben kills his character in the the film. And then uh, Hardman, uh, being a pretty nice guy about it, says, I take that as a tribute to my acting ability. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he made the character unlikable, so he he was playing the part. Yeah, and we've talked about that many times on this show, about how you know they did a good job when you fucking hate them. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Judith O'Day had one theory about Barbara. Rather than viewing her as a screaming woman, O'Day theorizes that Barbara had to retreat into her own mind to cope with what was going on, but would eventually get over the trauma and help everyone. She does ultimately try to help as the zombies are breaking into the house, but it's too little too late and she's quickly killed (sighs) as, as it goes. Um, The movie's a classic. The movie is played on every stinking horror movie that has any links to Halloween whatsoever. Uh, Except for maybe the movie Halloween, which has the thing, the original thing playing. That's the only one that I know of. Um, it's a it's a certified classic. I don't know what you can say, and it and it made zombies a thing, and I and I love them as a monster, even if they are fucking overused and overplayed at this point. Yeah, um, I've said it many times before that there to me there is something about a slow moving zombie that is able to sneak up on you, uh, strong enough to break down doors, um, works in packs, kind of. I, I, 
the scary moans, just the dead coming back to life. It's it's horrifying to me, to say the least. And I don't care if they're white faced with raccoon eyes or if they full blown Tom Savini makeup. That to me, they're all scary. Um, and I don't know what it is about the slower moving ones that seem more realistic that scare me more. I both have their place. I mean, the fast oh, and yeah. the slow. Um, the slow have that uh, encroaching or, you know, encroaching like, you know, impending death. Like there's no, uh, there's no keeping them back. Like they're going to keep coming. They're going to come after you. Uh, zombies tap into a fear, uh, multiple fears that people have. I mean, which has been pointed out by others. I mean, fear of viral contagion. I mean, that plays into it. Uh, fear of being like, you know, just overpowered by others, like, you know, who are actively trying to take you out. Um, something else that I was talking to about with uh, Cody a while back is that uh, one of the things that makes human beings such good predators in the wild is the fact that we don't tire like other uh, predators do. Most predators are designed for quick burst where they can catch up to their prey and then take them out really quick. And then they have to like, sleep for long lists of time to make up for the energy deficits they just burn off yeah human human beings can walk just walk for a long fucking time yeah without having to take a rest (laughs) so uh other creatures fear the shit out of us because of that i mean they might outrun us but if we're tracking something yeah uh, at some point in time they're going to have to go to sleep and we're going to fucking kill them Uh, zombies take that to the nth degree they yeah. never tire. Oh, they yeah. never sleep, and they will always be marching slowly toward you. Can we not talk about this anymore? I'm not liking where this is going. <laughs> I'm alone in a cold, dark studio. Um, the other thing about uh, these movies that I love, uh, zombies is a character or a creature that I love, is that you, just like Romero did so well whenever he was alive, at least up until his last few movies, Yeah, is that... <clears throat> you can take zombies and wrap other stories around them and make just like you said, oh the humans, yes. the, the meaning behind the movie, like what you're trying to critique. You can work a lot of stuff into a zombie movie that you can't do with other monsters. You can work in some allegories with like vampires, but a lot of that still comes back to like feeding and you know, whatever. And zombies, I mean, even though they eat, they don't eat for sustenance. They don't need to eat. No. They just eat. It's like they just um, eat for energy to keep eating. Yeah, so I mean, it's you can work a lot of other things around zombie movies, and 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 they and the best zombie movies do that. They have a point that they're getting across, and they're just using zombies as like the the main monster to deliver that point. So I, I love them for being so generic in the sense that they can be used in different ways. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I know one of your concerns was whether or not this was going to be a scary movie to me. I think it goes without saying that it is still a scary movie to me. It's very um, the thrill, the the intensity of the scenes. Uh, the black and white really does add to it. I don't know why this movie is still so scary to me. Probably because zombies are my thing. But I, I even watching the funny version of this film, I was like, I can't. You know, uh, these movies don't. I mean, I've desensitized myself to a lot of zombie movies, but I'll tell you something that get, did get me, and it's funny because it's the same thing that got me in Resident Evil 2. Uh, when Ben walks in front of the window and it's got enough openings for a bunch of hands to come through and they grab oh, him for the yeah. first time, I jumped. I was mm-hmm. like, fuck, I didn't think I would get got by this movie again, and it got me. <laughs> and gotcha. <that> thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't, I mean, there's, there's a lot that I mean is that's wrapped up in, in just the zombie thing in general, but I mean, Romero started it with this and I think, and I just find it interesting that he took a vampire novel yeah, as like his basis and which was based upon Dracula. So really Dracula inspired not a living dead in a roundabout way when it was all said and done. Yeah. Which is crazy. But, um, Anyways, as far as this movie goes, anything else you want to say? I it's I love it. I mean, even though it's an older movie, it, it still works. Do I prefer it versus the the remake? We'll get to that whenever we cover the remake. Yeah, but I, it's got its place, and it's definitely 
worthy of being shown at like every Halloween, basically. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm gonna bring up the rotting corpses scale because why not? But um, I would say uh, four out of five rotting corpses for me on this one because it's just it's just one of those classic films that if you're still getting to me in my forties and as much as it did when I was in my fives. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying you're doing you've you've done a great job. Uh I don't know if I can give it an honest rating because I mean it's if if I have to rank it versus the other ones, then oh, obviously yeah. it's it's lower down. But it's it's somewhere between four and four and a half for okay. sure for me. I think that's a fair rating. I wouldn't even have guessed you would have done that high. For me it's that high mostly because of the scare factor for me and I just have so much respect, much so much more respect for it now based on how much effort he put into making it what it was. And it's just so heartbreaking of how everything that happened, the fallout of it, meaning not getting the right copyright and everything else from it. So I think that's tragic. Uh, it's, it's a shame. And I wonder what Romero would have eventually went on to do if he would yeah. have made actual profits off this movie because i feel like a lot of his like later years was i mean kind of sour grapes a little bit yeah. as he was trying to you know seeing other people like massively profit off of the stuff that he came up with and then he and i mean he wasn't destitute i mean yeah. so there's that but he also was like i mean there was times when he, you know, would do pictures to at least, you know, get money. So he wouldn't have never, he would have never had to do that later on if this movie had really like that, that copyright issue, I don't think. Yeah, um, but I feel like if, even if he were broke, if George Romero, even back in the day when we didn't know how much of a cult following this film was going to get, came to me and I had seen that movie and he's like, hey, can you help me fund a film? I feel like a lot of places would be like, fuck yeah. Well, George was the kind of likable guy that he would have probably got the funding anyway. Yeah. So it's just that there's a lot of movies that he couldn't do. Like, for instance, Day was not the movie he wanted to do because he couldn't get the budget he wanted for it. He wanted it to be big and more of a spectacle. Yeah. And, uh, I, I mean, I love it for what it is, and I think he came to love it for what it was, but I think he had more in mind than, like, that the fact that he was stuck in that lower tier of like not getting like triple a type money yeah uh, really limited what he was able to do as far as some of his visions goes um and i mean and and he brought it up in that interview i was talking about where he mentions that zombie land like made a shit ton of money and, and it kind of sounded like he was a little bit bitter about that because they also which he said he was a little less uh you know uh, aggravated about that one because they were infected in that because they were running around and they had like the mad cow virus, which he's yeah, got a point. Mad cow. But, but, but still, it's um, seeing, you know, other people basically take the concept he came up with and then like, you know, really uh, make so much bank off of it whenever, like, you know, later on, like, he should have been the guy who directed the original Resident Evil movie and then they came to him last second and said, no, we're going to move on with somebody else. That's fucking bullshit. I mean, like, Resident Evil, the game, was clearly based on his works. The least they could have done was, like, throwing him a bone and let him direct the movie, which I think would have been ten times better if they had. Yeah, I, I concur. <laughs> but anyways, um, we'll get into a little bit more about the remake in the next episode and then cover the, the animated version. For now, peace be with you. And with your spirit.